How's it going everyone? Welcome to Two Left Thumbs. This is my Gaster Egg series on Undertale, a series of videos on the Easter eggs, references, and missable details within Undertale. Fans of Undertale connect with this game through its rich world and inventive characters. This Gaster Eggs series has ballooned to many, many hours of coverage through these layered interactions. With that wonderful narrative in mind, I want to let you know the next game published by Two Left Thumbs releases in just 48 hours. Repellafella is a point-and-click choose-your-own-adventure where your choices matter with multiple endings and many, many easter eggs to discover. Morning, old chap. Had a bit of a tumble, have you? Are you... are you really talking to me? The number one thing you can do for us right now is to wishlist the game on Steam. This lets Steam know people are interested, giving the game a more prominent placement on their store. So please, wishlist Repellafella to support me, the channel, and a wonderful solo developer, and consider buying the game when it releases this Monday. Back to Undertale. Throughout the waterfall, we can find these Echo Flowers, a unique flora that has the ability to repeat back the last sounds they heard. At the very start of the waterfall, we have an NPC who is known only as the Echo Flower Explainer. This is an Echo Flower. It repeats the last thing it heard, over and over. And when you interact with it, this is an Echo Flower. It repeats the last thing it heard, over and over. A very simple but easy to miss detail is if you had interacted with the Echo Flower first instead. All that gives my life validation is explaining the Echo Flower. No one can know. So he's just sitting here all day waiting for the opportunity to explain this flower. And talking to him after he's got a little twitch in his eye. Never trust a flower. That's one of the constants of this world. Referring, of course, to Flowey. And now, checking the Echo Flower again, never trust a flower, one of the constants of this world. And our little loop of interactions cuts off there. If you were instead doing the genocide route, the majority of them will make no sound, as they have not recently been exposed to anything to echo back. Starting right from this very first one, without the explainer standing nearby, it is strangely silent. In a neutral route, these flowers play out a conversation. Anyone who's played the game has likely seen that, I won't retread it. But if you move through the entire flower field, checking all of them along the way, and at the very end going back to the beginning, there are new special pieces of dialogue. If Toriel had been spared in the rooms, where oh where could that child be? I've been looking all over for them. <laughs> That's not true. She'll find another kid and instantly forget about you. You'll never see her again. Or if Toriel had been killed, where am I? It's so cold here and so dark. Someone help me. Anyone. Please help me. But nobody came. And in a full genocide route, backtracking through this field, spoken in Toriel's voice, it's strangely silent. There's a really funny gag here that Sans's sentry post still has snow on top of it, meaning he potentially picked up the precise one seen in Snowden. If you agree to go to Grillby's with Sans, he takes you on a little shortcut, something we never precisely see, even though he goes in the opposite direction. This is one of many examples where Sans can seemingly teleport around the world. Rather than rehashing all that, I'll instead include a little card in the corner here if anyone wants to watch a video on all the oddities surrounding Sans. We very much have Cheers vibes. Everyone here is big fans of Sans. They're all excited. Everybody knows his name. I got a little ahead of myself and I actually covered this section in the previous Snowden video. It kind of made sense to tie everything related to Grillby's together in a single video, so I won't rehash all these different branches. If when crossing you allow yourself to be pushed off, 
Down on the bridge below the falling rocks, you can interact with the center of the waterfall. Huh? There's a camera behind the waterfall. We eventually learn these cameras are all coming from Alfie's, and I believe this is the latest one you were able to find in the game. Down in the bottom right, an echo flower repeats back, I swore I saw something behind that rushing water. If you fight your way past the falling rocks up the middle, there is an extra little room up here. Inside, we can find a tutu lying on the ground here. Will you take it? You could leave it, although it doesn't really do anything, you might as well take it. You got the old tutu. Armor, defense 10. Finally, a protective piece of armor. These mushrooms also kind of squeak when you interact with them. They don't really have a purpose. On a genocide route, there are no rocks falling at all. After gaining the ability to call Undyne when phoning her in this specific area. God, I was supposed to build a puzzle for this room, but I hate puzzles. So I just put a huge pile of rocks upstream. So in a genocide route, there is nothing here because Undyne is kind of busy with, you know, everyone dying. That sort of takes priority, I think. On a regular route, when making our way through the tall grass, Papyrus gives a report to Undyne. Undyne asks if we fought, whether or not Papyrus captured us, but instead, on any route where Papyrus was killed, the camera simply pans up to show Undyne by herself. But she will still react once you get moving in the grass. Supposedly, Aaron is named after and slightly based on a former roommate of Toby Fox. I'm a little jealous that he was roommates with the horse mermaid man. As the game describes, he's intended to be a seahorse, which is a funny riff on that animal. And of course, Toby squeezed a horsepower joke into there. Aaron as a character shares similarities with a character from the old SNES game Breath of Fire 2, Director HR. A quote from that character is repeated by Aaron. Education, hobby, talent? And again, this time coming from Aaron. Education, hobby, talent? Aaron shares several similarities with the Homestuck character Equius, a character who is entirely horse-themed, although not literally a horse, with one of their defining features being that they are strong and immensely sweaty. Aaron is one of only a few characters in the game where you actually earn more gold from sparing than from killing. You earn 30 gold on a spare. If you instead kill Aaron, you only earn 25 gold. I feel like I'm participating in the Baltimore accent challenge. Earn, earn, and earn, earn. Damn, what the f- You really talk like that? Aaron, earn, and I earn, earn. During the first proper seed puzzle, we are intended to build a bridge across to that door off to the left. If you instead make a bridge along the bottom, we can read the sign, Congratulations! You failed the puzzle. Or you can instead send them off in the bottom right. There's kind of three rows here, you have to send them along the very topmost one. And they then create a bridge allowing you to walk off to the right to a secret room. There is a lone bench underneath which there is a lone quiche. Toby has said that this is kind of just a reference to his own life where he one time found an abandoned quiche under a bench. You get the abandoned quiche. Heals 34 HP, a psychologically damaged spinach egg pie. If you attempt to pick up the quiche while your inventory is full, you aren't ready for the responsibility. And checking the echo flower, I just wasn't ready for the responsibility. <laughs> The quiche was, was too much. This abandoned quiche has wholly unique flavor text to other items in the game. You leave the quiche on the ground and tell it you'll be right back. And if you drop anything else in this room, you abandoned that item. This is the first point at which we receive a phone call from Papyrus. He informs us that a friend of his, who we learn is Undyne, had seen us wearing whatever piece of armor we currently have equipped. She thought she saw you wearing a bandana. Is that true? Are you wearing a bandana? 
N no So you aren't wearing a bandana. Got it. You're my friend, so I trust you 100%. This dialogue will change depending on what you are wearing as a piece of armor. Which, by the way, the manly bandana itself is a reference to an item wearable by Flint in Mother 3. However, there are four possible outcomes if you play around with this interaction. You can tell the truth or lie, and then after either one of those interactions, you can either choose to keep your clothing as is or change it. If we had told the truth and did not change our clothes, when Papyrus calls you later, he reminds you about him asking about our clothes. Well, the friend who wanted to know, her opinion of you is very murdery. But I bet you knew that already. And because you knew that, I told her what you told me you were wearing. A dusty tutu. Because I knew, of course, after such a suspicious question, you would obviously change your clothes. You're such a smart cookie. This way, you're safe, and I didn't lie. No betrayal anywhere. Being friends with everyone is easy. If you said yes to what you were wearing, but then did change your clothes. Well, worry not, dear human. Papyrus would never betray you. I'm not a cruel person. I strive to be comforting and pleasant. Papyrus, he smells like the moon. So because of my inherent goodness, I told her you were not wearing a bandana, even though you told me you were. Instead, I made something up. I told her you were wearing a dusty tutu. It pained me to tell such a bold-faced lie. I know you would never, ever wear a dusty tutu, but your safety is more important than fashion. Dang, I just want to be friends with everyone. If you say no, that is not what you're wearing, and do not change. Well, worry not, dear human. Papyrus would never betray you. You said you were not wearing a bandana, so of course I actually told her you were indeed wearing a bandana. It pained me to tell such a bold-faced lie. But since you aren't wearing a bandana, she surely won't attack you. Now you are safe and sound. Wowee, this is hard. I just want to be everybody's friend. And finally, one further interaction with the biggest bend in logic out of any of them. I have to show the specific example to help keep this one straight. She thought she saw you wearing a dusty tutu. Is that true? Are you wearing a dusty tutu? If you then say no, so you aren't wearing a dusty tutu. Got it. You're my friend, so I trust you 100%. Have a nice day, but then we do still choose to change into a different item regardless. But I bet you knew that already, and because you knew that, I knew when you said I am not wearing a dusty tutu, it was really a secret code. You really meant I actually am wearing a dusty tutu. You were trying to protect yourself while making it so I didn't have to lie. I picked up on this and followed your plan. I told her you were not wearing a dusty tutu. In fact, I took it one step further. I told her you were probably wearing a faded ribbon. Of course, you would never wear that. But that's the point. She won't recognize you now, and I didn't have to betray either of you since I just told her what you said. Wowee, you're such a smart cookie. I really can be friends with everyone. So the interaction is set up in a way that is unavoidable. We will always get chased down by Undyne. Washua, oh sweet, clean Washua. One of the most immediate things I can point out with this character is that its face was seemingly designed to look like the MS Paint Adventures logo, which is the larger umbrella from Andrew Hussey under which Homestuck falls. Washua is specifically labeled in the credits as being inspired by Omocat, the developer of Amori. Many have compared Washua to the Sprout Mole from that game. If you attempt to joke with Washua, they always have the same response. No, that joke's too dirty! But there are three possible jokes that can be told. You tell a joke about a kid who ate a pie with their bare hands. 
You tell a joke about two kids who played in a muddy flower garden. You tell a joke about a kid who slept in the soil. Those three jokes, when told together, allude to the story of the fallen human and Asriel eating Toriel's pies, playing together in the flower garden, with that third one about sleeping in the soil being an implication of something far, far worse than sleeping in the soil. You know, taking a little, a little dirt nap, perhaps? Washua is friends with a little bird. Presumably the little bird floating around in their tank that's just tweeting away. There is a pair of dialogues that don't necessarily appear in order, but the first part of it is scrub-a-dub-dubs, a common enough phrase, and the second part is oops, I meant scrub-a-sub-subs, being a little reference to the subs versus dubs debate when watching things like anime. Washu is apparently a monster of culture being familiar with Shakespeare. Their line, Out, darned spot, is a reference to a scene in Macbeth. Out, damned spot, out, I say. Lady Macbeth is starting to lose her grip on reality and believes that she's seeing blood on her hands even when there is none, exclaiming, Out, damned spot, out, I say. There's an enjoyable little gag here where there's a crystallized piece of cheese that is now fused to the table. Inside this hole is simply a little mouse that squeaks and the echo flower just squeaks right back. After escaping Undyne, at the bottom of this short bridge we have this blob who will escort you on a ferry for three gold, but really they just suck you down into the water. Thanks for stepping on my face! Here's the three gold. You got three gold instead of paying it. This can be done indefinitely, allowing you to repeatedly farm three gold. So if you were in desperate need of money, that's one way to go about it. It's just not overly efficient. In this room where Sands is hanging out with the telescope, you can interact with the southern wall. The gems here shine in a spectacular pattern. It's a nice thing you can see the southern wall from this angle. The player is actually tipped off to the existence of this later in game when calling Undyne with Papyrus. Hey, here's a neat party trick. Try talking to the southern wall. First you have to throw a party though. Hey, you should make it a costume party. Then Papyrus can have some place he seems normal. And a quick follow-up call. Oh, I should invite Alfie's too. Sans's telescope doesn't look at anything, and it gives you a bit of paint on your eyeball. First, a very brief reminder on Undertale's fun values. Every time you start a new game, a fun value between 1 and 100 is randomly generated for your save file. These fun values are what determine encountering very specific things within your playthrough. The first one you would encounter in Waterfall is also probably the most famous and most significant. With a fun value of exactly 66, there is an additional hallway in Waterfall. This fake hallway appears near Sans's telescope room. If you enter this hallway and then leave it, it will disappear for good. And on top of having that 1 in a 100 chance of having 66 as your fun value, there is an additional 10% chance, meaning you have a 1 in 1000 chance of encountering this room. On the other side of this gray door, we have the Mystery Man. This skeletal-like figure with crazed eyes and cracks on his face. And as many have pointed out, it sort of has a face no matter which direction you flip it. This sprite is so simplistic and leaves so much room for interpretation that obviously all of us theorists have gone kind of bonkers over it over the years. I go very in-depth in those pieces of Gaster videos, so I won't retread that ground here. All you need to know for now is when interacting with the mystery man, he gives a surprised look and then fades away. When inspecting a mold small in the waterfall, it tells you it's a different color, so it's a bit stronger now. 
These monsters are made to look like jelly cakes that were popular in the 60s, but they're also a send-up of the trope of having slime characters be an entry-level enemy in RPGs, ones who are then often palette-swapped the deeper into the game you get, with the changes in color being used to represent their growing power. Way off to the left through this maze area, in a lone patch of grass, you can find a pair of ballet shoes. These used shoes make you feel incredibly dangerous. Now we have a full ballerina combo of the shoes and the old tutu. When first heading along this path, Onion-san introduces themselves to us and has a little conversation as we make our way across then sinking back down into the waters below. If we come back to this room a second time, it opens up a new conversation. Did you hear? You're back. I'll tell you a big secret. I'm starting a band, do you hear? It's called the Red Hot Chibi Peppers, which is obviously a reference to the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Swapping that out for Chibi. All I've thought of is the name, and I don't play instruments or sing. Well... Do you think we'll be popular? You can say yes or no. If you say no, they are obviously disappointed and slink away into the depths. If you instead say, yeah, they'll respond, yeah, me too, and will continue to follow you around the room, but won't have any further dialogue. If you come back and revisit onion Sun one more time, oh, did you hear? I got nothing else to talk about. Shiren is a very particular, very strange monster in the sense that they appear to be two monsters stack on top of one another. This is made abundantly clear that when you defeat Shiren, the agent is left behind. They are a play on a siren, a mythical creature of Greek mythology. Beautiful creatures who would lure sailors to their death. But this one is shy, they're a shyren, tone deaf. She's too ashamed to sing her deadly song. If you hum to Shiren, she pops out her face and she begins to sing along, gaining some level of confidence. If we continue to hum along to encourage Shiren to come out of her shell, you hum some more. Monsters are drawn to the music. Suddenly it's a concert. Sands is selling tickets made of toilet paper. You hum some more, the seats are sold out, you feel like a rock star. The crowd tosses clothing, it's a storm of socks. You hum some more, but the constant attention, the tours, the groupies, it's all aggressive tooting. Shiren thinks about her future. You and Shiren have come so far, but it's time. You both have your own journeys to embark on. You hum a farewell song. Final toot. A final song to see everything through. We somehow eclipsed the entire career of a pop idol in about 30 seconds of battle. The sample used for Shiren's vocals, as well as part of the track Ghost Fight, are actually lifted directly from the singer Venus in Earthbound. If you attempt to smile at Shiren, to get her to smile back, Shiren gets quieter. In the corner, Aaron nods his head approvingly. Apparently, he's just watching this play out. If Papyrus has been killed, not even a full genocide route, then Sans' involvement in this concert plays out much differently. A hooded figure watches the commotion from afar. There is a little gag with conduct, like if you were trying to be a musical conductor, you wave your arms wildly, you are now vulnerable to electric attacks, like a conductor of electricity. 
Shiren is a fascinating character. She has obviously returned in Deltarune and potentially has some significance there. There are more odd ways in which Shiren is tied into the larger lore of this universe. I already had a dedicated section about that in my Pieces of Gaster Volume 2 video, so I will instead put a card to that in the corner. It covers plenty of other things as well, but across all my various Deltarune Undertale videos, I know I already do have to repeat myself more than I would like while covering these different aspects, but I go quite in depth on that one, and so it would make more sense to watch that other video rather than going over it twice. Later on, in the waterfall, we have this lone statue being dripped upon. It's a statue. The structures at its feet seem dry. Immediately next to this, we have a bucket filled with umbrellas. The sign here is telling us to take one, so we can choose to take one. You took an umbrella. Now, there are multiple things you can do with this umbrella once you have it. If you take this umbrella forward with you to see Monster Kid, yo, you got an umbrella? Awesome. Let's go. Monster Kid sticks closely with you, taking advantage of the umbrella. And once we reach this end point here, we aren't going to be able to climb with the umbrella, and so our only option there would be to return the umbrella. This is how you progress through this section of the game, so I'm sure everyone has seen all that before. Monster Kid helps lift us up, but then totally leaves. If you had carried through this section normally, then this save point will read, The sound of muffled rain on the cave top. It fills you with determination. You can head backwards and give it to the statue. Yes. You place the umbrella atop the statue. Inside the statue, a music box begins to play. Undyne will comment that the statue has been here forever. No one knows where it came from. What we do know is that it serves as a music box when water flows through it, playing the song Memory, which is a music box version of his theme, also known as Asriel's theme. The only other fountain in-game is the Royal Memorial Fountain, built in 21X, with Metaton being added last week. 21X is when Chara fell down, and is the decade in which Chara and Asriel both died. This statue is likely a piece of the Royal Memorial Fountain, serving as a direct tribute to those lost royal children. I love these layered details for those who are willing to connect the dots. We have this absurd, ridiculous fountain shooting water all over the floor, making a mockery of something tragic and heartfelt. It's part of what makes Undertale so special. If you had instead given your umbrella to the statue. Jumping back ahead for a brief moment to that save point. The serene sound of a distant music box. It fills you with determination. Through this, we're also provided the solution to the piano puzzle. At the top, it begins to show you the pattern so you don't have to try to just do it by ear. Back at the piano, just a few screens before, if you choose to play it. Open, up, right, open, down, down, right. This opens up a new door for us, inside of which it's a legendary artifact. Will you take it? You can leave it, but we should probably take it. We'll go back. Will you take it? You bet I will. You're carrying too many dogs? Which I distinctly did not know I was carrying a dog. I had an open space in my inventory. It is now filled in with an annoying dog. Dog. A little white dog. It's fast asleep. If you attempt to use the little white dog, you deployed the dog. The dog absorbs the artifact and wanders off the screen somewhere you cannot follow. The artifact is gone. 
you can leave, come back, there's, there's nothing to be done about it. And there is the dog residue in the menu instead. Dog item. Glowing crystals secreted by a dog. If you choose to use the residue, you finished using it. An uneasy atmosphere fills the room. If you use it a second time, it has a repeated dialogue, but now you have the dog salad. Heals question mark HP? Recovers HP. Hit poodles. And if you use, you eat the dog salad. Oh, tastes yappy. Your HP was maxed out. And now we have finally gotten rid of dog-related items in our inventory. The dog actually enters your inventory as soon as you enter this room, so there is no ability to interact with this without the annoying dog being present. So you're never able to pick it up because you're carrying too many dogs. And if you instead were to attempt to drop the dog, you put the dog on the ground, and it plays out the exact same way with the dog then absorbing the artifact and making their way off screen. There are a few ways to get around this. If you were to enter this room with a full inventory, not leaving room for the dog. If you pass this section, get the upgrade to your phone from Alfie's, you can then put the dog in the dimensional box. Or you can use a debug system of some sorts to alter your inventory and remove the annoying dog. No matter through which means you do so, when you then go to interact with the artifact, it will tell you this will never happen. It both mocks the player while serving as an inside joke for programmers. This is a string often attached to code that is not meant to be executed, being used in a way that would tell the programmer that something is happening that shouldn't. And here, Toby is playing with that very literally. And on any subsequent interactions, it claims the artifact is fully gone. If you call Toriel in the artifact room, the ringing is coming from inside your inventory, suggesting that the annoying dog actually stole Toriel's phone. When you have a single dog residue and a bunch of empty spaces in your inventory and use the dog residue, the rest of your inventory filled up with dog residue. So you now have a single salad and a bunch of residues. If you drop one on the ground, it was thrown away, same as you would expect. If you use any of the residues, the rest of your inventory fills up with residue, in addition to a single salad. So you can somewhat endlessly chain this together and then sell these at shops. It's a pretty easy way to make near infinite money. If you totally skip an umbrella and try to advance forward, we get rained on, a little splashy, not so bad, and we have Monster Kid. Yo, you can't hold an umbrella either? If you're walking anyway, I guess I'll go with you. Let's go! So you don't even actually <laughs> need the umbrella to advance through this section. I just think it's a really funny joke to point out that Monster Kid has no arms and is therefore unable to use an umbrella themselves. We can attempt to bring Monster Kid back with us. Yo, I already looked. Undyne's not over here, so I guess I'll see you later. <laughs> they run back ahead and go to hang out in the same spot as before. If you go and get an umbrella and come back, Monster Kid is now enthusiastic that we grabbed an umbrella for their sake. Ah, oh, you're the best. And they join us once again. We can backtrack even further with the umbrella in hand. When you talk to this NPC who previously asked us all about stars, what are you holding? Is that a star? And Sans, dang, I wish I brought a parasol. I'm getting a nasty burn from all this sun. The fairy NPC will not allow you. Ah, no umbrellas allowed. There is one other waterfall fun value that I will include in this video. With a value between 90 and 100, back towards the docks right where Undyne first started chasing us, you will encounter a gray version of Monster Kid, whose sprite in the game files is titled MKID Goner. Have you ever thought about a world where everything is exactly the same except you don't exist? Everything functions perfectly without you. Ha! <laughs> ha! 
The thought terrifies me. And since you only have a 1 in 10 chance of encountering this goner kid, there are many, many worlds where this character does not exist at all, and the remainder of the game does progress without any sort of butterfly effect ramifications of this character being missing. Or if you bring the goner kid the umbrella, an umbrella? But it's not raining. Ha, <laughs> ha. You know? That does make me feel a little better about this. Thank you. Please forget about me. And following up, please don't think about me anymore. If you were to leave and come back, then the goner kid is gonered. Monster Kid does make a return in Deltarune, so it's not like they never existed in any other world as this implies. But their comment on it not currently raining makes many think of the 63rd track in the Undertale soundtrack, It's Raining Somewhere Else, one that plays specifically while we're sitting down to dinner with Sans. How exactly that ties in remains to be seen, maybe additional answers will be given through Deltarune's newest chapters, but for now, it's just something to be aware of and to maybe start spitballing some theories over. One last use for the umbrella, we can take it to the nice cream guy. Umbrella solidarity? I guess I have to give you a deal. Discount ice cream, 15 gold. So you're actually saving, I believe it's 10 gold per nice cream at that point. Hey, you have an umbrella, just like my cart. Such solidarity. I have no choice. Ice cream discount, yes, super, here you go. Because this bucket contains numerous umbrellas, it is possible to gather up umbrellas even after you've used one. But there aren't really interactions that come from doubling down on umbrellas. Here's one last reminder for you to go wishlist Repella Fella. Please do so if you have a Steam account. This final push immediately before release is super important for that overall visibility. There is a free prologue of the game if you want to try it out for yourself first. That currently has a 100% positive rating on Steam. Do not sleep on Repella Fella, you're going to love it. I'm excited to be getting back into covering Undertale. This has been on hiatus for a while, as I obviously had to focus really hard on Deltarune Chapter 2 as soon as that dropped, but I'm excited to be able to do these videos again on Undertale. They won't come out super rapid fire release style the way I was doing with Deltarune Chapter 2, because for those I was really figuring it out as I went. This series is much more about doing the research ahead of time, which takes a lot of effort than putting it all together into a single video. And assuming that the next chapter of that game is still a ways away, maybe I can finish covering Undertale before that full game releases. It should be doable, right? I'm still gonna space things out a bit, keep an eye out in the coming weeks, there will be more videos covering the rest of the waterfall. And then again, I'll probably take a bit of a break from Undertale Deltarune content and I'll bring it back later in the year. These videos just take a while to put together, so it helps me out to space them out like that. Generally, I would recommend anyone come join the Two Left Thumbs Discord, there will be links to that down below as well. But if you're a part of the Patreon, then you get access to a a private channel where we hang out. Ooh, it's so exclusive. <laughs> anyway, thank you all so much for watching. Thank you to patrons of the channel for their continued support, and I'll see you again soon.